Good evening, everyone. It's May 19th, 2021, and you're here at the annual general meeting for the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation. My name's Audrey Hill. I'll be, I'll be the MC for the evening, and um, I just want to welcome everyone, a very warm welcome to everyone. I want to thank you all for attending. And just to let you know, give you a heads up that all the material that you'll need for the um, EDT will be online here, will be, on, will be on the screen that you will see. All the materials for the audit are also going to be shown on screen. And um, just as a heads up, we will have a question and answer period for each audit. Please save questions, your questions until that time. So um, what I wanted to start with right now is uh, there's no screen for this, but the first screen is for the introduction of the panelists. And there's going to be a screen up for that. And that will be for the introduction will be for the chairs. Hilary Vichu, who's the chair of the advisory committee. Philip Johnson, who's the chair of the board of directors. Elena Benibri, who's the chair of the board of trustees and Matt Jemison, who is our president and CC CEO. Uh, the other one that we will be introducing is David Marks. He's the auditor from KPMG. And that gets us started and we're on to Matt to do the review. Okay, so for this evening, we've got the agenda up in front of us. We're gonna run through a quick overview of the group, all of the members of the development corporation group. Uh, we'll run through the presentation of the economic development trust audit uh, with David Marks and Elena as the chair. And then we'll move on to the presentation of the Economic Development Corporation audit. There are two separate audits, one for the trust and one for the corporation. We'll highlight the appointment of the auditor for, for this year and next. And we'll take some time looking at the year review and some time looking uh, forward and what we think uh, the, the rest of 2021 is going to bring us. And then as uh, Audrey said, we're going to have a question and answer period after we run through the PowerPoint. Uh, and so if you could please hold your questions until then, that would be fantastic. Okay, the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation or Development Group is, um, it has a structure of three separate boards. Um, you can see the names on the top here. Uh, Philip Johnson, who's the chair for the board of directors, Justin Porter and Janice Mentor. For the Board of Trustees, we have Elena Benivri, who's our chair, Rachel Martin, Kathy General, Micah Burning, and Andrew Joseph. For the Advisory Committee, Hilary Vichu is our chair. Members are Reva Bumbry, Erica Marticius, Audrey Hill, and Trina Henhock. And just briefly, the Advisory Committee is, is in place to provide oversight of the of the Six Nations Grand River Development Corporation's Board of Directions, Board of Directors and Economic Development Trust. This includes ensuring each entity is acting in a socially responsible manner, which preserves the Six Nations cultural integrity and operates in line with the values and the long-term plan of the community. The Board of Directors under Philip Johnson oversees the business activities of the Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation, including supervision of the president and CEO according to the guide, guiding principles and approved policies. For the board of trustees, Elena Benivri and her, and her group are responsible to determine how surplus funds received from Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation's businesses will be invested back into the Six Nations community collectively. And with that, I'll turn the rest back over now to, let's see, what are we doing next? Our next is, um, is the audit slide, number three, and I'm going to turn this over to David Marks now. Thank you, David. Thank you very okay. much, Audrey, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. Happy to uh, work our way through uh, the, the couple of audits. The, the first audit is the uh, uh, Economic Development Trust Audit, and uh, so I will uh, walk you through the financial statements. Uh, the first slide that, uh, that we have is the, the audit opinion, and uh, happy to say if uh, maybe we move to the next slide there, please. Yeah, great. Um, 
Uh, we have issued our audit opinion on the development trust. Uh, that opinion was issued on April 7th, uh, 2021. It was a clean audit opinion uh, saying that uh, the financial results uh, as presented in the financial statements are, are fairly presented in accordance with uh, the accounting guidelines for uh, not-for-profit organizations. Uh, so if we could then maybe switch over to the financial statements, uh, I'll run you through a couple of the highlights uh, on each of the, the statements. The statement of financial position. So this is the, uh, the balance sheet. So this uh, contains all the assets and liabilities of, uh, of the trust. So you can see, uh, you know, in terms of a financial position, things are all, all balanced. Uh, there is cash in hand, uh, you know, for, for the trust uh, that will enable it to, uh, to make any future distributions out to the, uh, the community. And, uh, and I'll kind of go through uh, some of the other pieces as we go to the notes. So if you want to scroll down to the next page, Thank you. Uh, this is the, the statement of operations in trustees equity. Uh, you can see that the organization, the trust uh, received distributions in from uh, the Six Nations Development uh, Corporation and, and the related entities there of uh, $1.3 million, uh, had a little bit of interest revenue as well, uh, and then expenses that, uh, that are incurred uh, during the normal course of business to, uh, to administer the trust. Uh, and you can see at the end, uh, you know, any funds, uh, you know, excess of revenues or expenses are then, uh, you know, uh, deemed to be distributions, uh, future distributions that are to the, the benefit of the, uh, the trust, the trustees and the, the benefit of the community. Um, so all amounts uh, that are available through the trust are then available to be distributed uh, as part of the, the mandate of the, the economic trust. Thank you. So uh, you can see here, this is the, uh, the the full amount of the distributions received and receivable from uh, the uh, Economic Development Trust. Uh, the the $1.3 million came from the Master Trust uh, side of things uh, of the entity. Uh, note three, as, uh, as we scroll down slightly, uh, this is the, the distributions, future distributions that are payable to the, the beneficiaries, which is the, the community. So you can see at the end of the year, December 31st, 2020, uh, there is a balance of $5.186 million, uh, which are funds available uh, that can be distributed uh, to the community through the, uh, the development trust. Okay. And, uh, and finally, on uh, the next page, uh, note number five, uh, we can see that during the course of the year, here are the distributions that, uh, that have been uh, made uh, to the community members. Uh, I think there might be another slide uh, that, uh, that happens in our discussion that happens after. Uh, but you can see here's all the, the amounts that have been paid during the course of the year. Uh, there are certain amounts that have been approved during the uh, the 2020 year that were not distributed for, for various reasons. Uh, and down at the bottom, you can see uh, $1.4 million was authorized to be uh, approved through distributions to the beneficiaries uh, in 2020. So I would say that uh, those are the comments that, uh, that I have on the financial statements and uh, maybe back to, uh, I'm not sure if it's you, Matt or Alana uh, for further discussion. Good evening, everyone. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank on behalf of the trust, any community members and local media currently present or watching in the future uh, as this will be posted for taking part in our joint AGM. Also to our tireless administration for all of the work that they do to provide the community with resources and assistance in applying for these trust funds. And for me, an enormous amount of gratitude to the trustees both past and present uh, for their commitment to ensuring that these dollars are getting back to the community in ways that will benefit our membership currently and in the future. So 2020, uh, as we all know, was a very unusual year in many ways for individuals and organizations alike. So we are pleased to share with you these successful and despite a worldwide pandemic, completed projects funded in 2020. So as you can see on your screen, we have a list of the 2020 grassroots recipients, uh, two row on the grand, which is um, a symbolic reenactment, reenactment of the two row wampum. So 
um, those those volunteers from this organization uh, usually take uh, a eight to ten day trip down the Grand River. This year, uh, it was scaled down significantly uh, due to COVID, so they did require um, a, a, a smaller amount of money this year. Uh, and Jamison Elementary Home and School Association. So this project, uh, an application that was funded allowed them to purchase um, an, a double-sided digital LED sign for the road for them to be able to communicate with their families and the community at large. And then we have the 2020 general recipients. So we have eight projects there. Um, and if there are any questions about those individual projects, I'll certainly take those um, after this. After this, uh, I just wanted to say though that of these projects, uh, which we are, are really proud of, it, they touched on six of the eight community priorities that are identified in the community plan. So um, I, I think that's significant. Um, and well, on to the next slide, while you're taking a look at the emergency relief fund recipients on slide seven, I'd like to take this time to elaborate on the emergency funds distribution policy, which is what allowed the trust to assist these local nonprofits in acquiring necessary supplies to meet the Six Nations health and safety guidelines, as well as the reallocation of funds from the central administration building project on the previous slide to the internet tower project. So the emergency funds distribution policy was enacted during the summer of 2020 in response to a declared state of emergency. And the policy allows for recipients to modify the scope of their project, defer the funding to the next year or terminate the funding agreement without prejudice. The trust will operate under this policy for the duration of this declared state of emergency and it is, it is reviewed every 14 days to ensure its applicability. It was brought to the trust attention that local nonprofits would not be eligible for the $5,000 Six Nations Emergency Business Funding. Uh, and although um, this was a, a maximum grant amount of $1,000 per eligible organization for nonprofits, as you can see this impromptu initiative had a great reach in terms of benefits to multiple demographics and in various areas of community service. So for their first call, um, we invested $4,500 to those um, organizations that you see on the screen. And the second call was $3,000 and all to home and school associations. So a total investment of $7,500 uh, to help our nonprofits uh, with health and safety during this time. And that's it for me. And we can move on to the question and answer. Audrey, if that's... Okay, yes, we're into question and answers. And Elena and David Marks will be here to answer the questions. Hi, uh, Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Uh, just wondering if uh, I can ask how COVID impacted the trust. Hi, Victoria. Thanks for your question. Um, so our, our impacts, I think, are in the future. Um, so there will be, uh, we're assuming, and the corporation is assuming that there will be less surplus coming from the master trust, just due to um, everything being closed and not being able to get those tourism dollars. So we are um, trying to manage future um, funding. So what we have done is taken the pot of money that is available for next year and split it into two so that um, we've assured that the community has some trust fund dollars for 2023 um, should the corporation and the master trust be significantly impacted. Other than that, um, we did do a lot of work to uh, get that um, non-for-profit, not-for-profit grant um, out to the community as soon as possible. So there was a lot of work there and and I think that that's it. Is there anything more that David that you wanted to admit that you wanted to say? Uh, no and I guess maybe just uh, along the, the lines of uh, you know planning for future years uh, you know from a financial statement, 
perspective, you can see the the cash balance that uh, that the organization has that uh, that will enable them to to be able to uh, manage funds going into the future. So, thank you. Just, thank uh, you. Corresponds nicely with what Alana said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you, David and Elena. Um, we're going to move on now to the presentation of the 2020 Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation audit. And uh, the auditor, again, David Marks, will be there to, will be here to make the presentation. And I'm also going to say that Philip, Philip Johnson, who's the chair of the board of directors and Matt Jemison, president and CEO, are available as resources. Again, uh, remarks or presentation will be made and there will be time for questions after. So keep your questions, write them down. And I'm gonna turn it back over to David. Slide number nine. Great, thanks, Audrey. And uh, again, thank you for for having me here to uh, to present this. Uh, so we have issued our audit opinion on the Development Corp. That uh, that opinion was issued on uh, May twelfth, uh, twenty twenty one. Again, it is a, a clean, unqualified audit opinion. Uh, again, saying that the the financial statements fairly represent the activities of the uh, the operations of the Development Corp. and uh, are in accordance with the the accounting framework, uh, accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations. So uh, maybe from here, if, uh, if we want to flip over to uh, the financial statements and, uh, and I will walk through uh, a few things on the financial statements. So this is the, uh, the, the statement of financial position or the balance sheet for uh, the, the corporation. Um, quite a lot of activity, as you can see, uh, you know, within the organization uh, uh, that uh, essentially this will show you all the assets and liabilities. Uh, you can see the top section are the, the current assets, uh, cash receivables, et cetera, that, uh, that are held by the organization. Uh, it's a, a strong working capital. Uh, the working capital is your current assets compared to your current liabilities. So you can see that uh, there's uh, assets in excess of the, the liabilities. Uh, which is, uh, you know, a good position to, to have. Uh, and then you can see certainly in the, in the assets that uh, the organization has uh, investments in economic interest projects of about $60.6 million, capital assets of uh, $11.3 million. Um, and then at the, the liability side of things, you can see there's some uh, long-term debt that's helped to, to fund that. Uh, and then the equity position of the organization. So I will go through some of those details as, uh, as we move through the presentation. Uh, if you could skip over to the next page, uh, which is the, the statement of uh, earnings. Uh, so this is the, the statement of earnings, uh, shows all the revenues and expenses of the, the organization. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the comparative information here is a full year for 2020 and a nine month period for 2019. So you can certainly see uh, COVID in 2020 has uh, obviously had an impact on the organization. Uh, the, the nation's enterprises, which are uh, includes the um, uh, gathering place on the Grand, the Bingo Hall, et cetera, uh, big impact uh, obviously on the amount of revenues and, and, and additionally the expenses that, uh, that you see uh, happening within the organization to, to support some of those operations. So in the end, uh, as you roll through, uh, total revenues were uh, just about 30 million uh, for the 12-month the period in, in 2020, uh, $18.9 million worth of expenses, uh, which give uh, an overall kind of net income or excess of revenues over expenses uh, before the distributions uh, to the Economic Development Trust of uh, 10.9 million. And you can see the, uh, the $1.3 million that we talked about uh, you know, in the other financial statements uh, being distributed to the uh, development trust. Okay. I'll move over uh, down a couple pages uh, to the statement of cash flow. We'll, we'll skip this next one, please. And uh, yes, this is the, uh, the one. Uh, Potentially, if you can make that a little bit bigger, those numbers are a little hard to, to see. Yeah, that's, uh, that's probably okay. 
Uh, so this shows the uh, cash flow from operations, financing activities, investing activities. So from operations, uh, you know, the, the business generated $8.7 million worth of cash. Uh, they used uh, one point, uh, about $1.8 million to uh, finance debt and make repayments of debt. Uh, there was some additional borrowing there that you can see. Uh, and then they invested, uh, you know, that money into various things, capital assets, uh, you know, other projects, et cetera, uh, that are showing in the investing um, activities of the cash flow. So overall cash, uh, slight decrease in cash of $1 million, uh, you know, one year over the next. Uh, but this is a good uh, statement to see how that money uh, kind of flowed through the organization. Uh, I will get you to maybe flip to page 10 and note six. And, and as you do that, I'll just talk about the accounting policy. So no changes in accounting policies during the course of the year. So those all remained uh, consistent with what they had been in, in previous years. Um, as we get to, to note six, uh, here's the details of the investments uh, you know, that uh, the Economic Development Corp holds. Uh, so you can see down at the bottom, there's the, the 60 million point six um, uh, dollars worth of uh, investments that are spent. Uh, some are carried at cost, which is the above section. Others are held as the uh, equity accounted, uh, which is a, just an accounting method. Uh, so you can see all the investments, a couple new ones uh, during the course of the year, uh, three uh, DAX Corporation, Oneida Energy LP as well. Uh, and then the rest are, have stayed static other than the ones that are equity accounted, which uh, you normally see some fluctuations. Uh, and you can see in this situation, uh, A6N, uh, you know, incurred some losses and maybe Roxanne, if we could uh, go down to the next page, um, you can see some of the, uh, that's it, great. Uh, down in the middle of the page, you can see uh, the A6N joint venture, the revenues and expenses and uh, the loss that, uh, that was incurred. And, and this is uh, the economic interest portion of, uh, of that entity. So uh, I'm sure there's other commentary that, uh, that can be had uh, you know, on, on that particular investment in the, the year that they had. Uh, but uh, for, for this point, I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and move on to um, page 14, note 12. Uh, so down at the bottom of the, the page, you can see the derivative options. Uh, you, you may or may not recall from previous years that uh, you know, part of one of the agreements that they had with uh, uh, an investment um, in order to get some distributions, there were some alternative uh, type of arrangements made, uh, one being these derivative options. So uh, during the course of this year, those have all been settled out. Uh, you know, through a refinancing that uh, that happened within the the project. So, um, you know, those have been removed from the the balance sheet, uh, and a, a small gain of sixty two thousand dollars was was recognized in the in the income statement for that. Okay, uh, we'll flip down to the next page on uh, page uh, note fifteen. Uh, just talk about uh, these uh, note 15 and note 16 uh, conceptually to, to let you know what they are. Uh, these are the amount of funds in note 15 that uh, the organization has used their own equity. So funds and uh, you know that have come into the organization. Uh, that have been then utilized to purchase capital assets. So you can see, uh, you know, the organization has purchased uh, $11.3 million worth of capital assets. Um, a portion of that has come from other uh, grants that, to, that have been received during the courses of the years, uh, and a small portion that has been funded by a little bit of debt. Uh, but of their own equity, uh, about uh, $10.9 million of their own funds have been used to uh, you know, reinvest into the capital uh, assets, uh, you know, projects as uh, uh, the uh, gathering place on the Grand, uh, you know, as well as uh, Chiefs Wood Park. Okay. Uh, similarly, for note 16, invested in economic interest process uh, projects, uh, you can see that uh, the total investments that uh, the organization has in those projects is uh, $60.6 million. And again, uh, they spent uh, you know, 
$22.7 million of the equity that they've achieved uh, on these projects, and the rest of it has been financed by debt. And so as um, the organization pays debt down, uh, they've invested more in those, uh, those projects with their own cash. So those are two very important numbers to, uh, to consider uh, when thinking about the, the equity of uh, the organization. Uh, and then finally, with the, the equity of the organization, if we move to the next page, uh, the organization has, uh, you know, through the, the board of directors, as well as the advisory committee, uh, approved uh, various restrictions on the remaining equity of the organization. So this is everything else that is left, um, you know, in the organization in the equity, and, and they've put it into various buckets, uh, you know, for various reasons. So uh, some that has been put aside to, uh, to service the debt requirements over the upcoming months. Um, other amounts that have been put aside for capital projects, I think there's $3.1 million there. Uh, there's a post-pandemic relief reserve to, to help, uh, you know, fund, uh, you know, operations of the, the corporation, given the uncertainty of $3.1 million. Uh, you know, some other commitments that the organization has made. Uh, as well, uh, you know, so that's 6.6 6 or 6.8 million dollars, I think there, um, that has been set aside for, for future purposes. Uh, and then the next section down, uh, you can highlight the, the restricted operating reserve of a million dollars, which is also set aside as a contingency reserve, uh, you know, if needed. And the remaining funds are really tied up in working capital, et cetera, uh, you know, for the organization. Okay, uh, scroll down to the next page there. That's great. So uh, page 18, uh, sorry, note 18, uh, the distribution. So you can see uh, here's the distributions that uh, have been moved over to uh, the development trust of uh, $1.3 million. Um, certainly some decisions made during the course of the year on, uh, on amounts to, to move over to the, uh, the master trust given the economic environment uh, that we're in. Uh, the next page shows uh, just on note B of 18, uh, how some of those, those revenues that, uh, and net income that we talked about at the, the very beginning on the statement of earnings, uh, you know, how that has been kind of maneuvered within the, uh, the operation. So uh, where we're starting with the amounts that have, uh, you know, or before distributions, certain amounts have been set aside for investments in uh, economic interest entities, others, uh, you know, for the debt restructuring, uh, you know, some of the working capital reserves, et cetera, that, uh, that we talked about before. And you can see what was available for distribution to the trust uh, was the, the $1.3 million. Okay. I'll move over to note 23 on page 21. Uh, so there's a, a couple of investments and, uh, and opportunities that uh, the organization has entered into. Uh, you know, one, the, the 3D, uh, 3DAX one, where there's options uh, for the or organization at their discretion to uh, acquire shares uh, or additional shares of the, the organization. Um, based on uh, the, the position there, there was no value assigned to those at the, uh, the existence and the issuance of those, those options. Uh, but management does have, uh, you know, another, um, you know, several months to decide whether they want to exercise those options or not. Uh, and again, that's all with, uh, you know, some of the other agreements that uh, the organization has entered into. Um, the second one is, uh, you know, longer term receivable, uh, you know, where the organization has lent money to uh, thrive uh, and also has the ability to, uh, you know, acquire shares and, and thrive at a later point in time, uh, you know, based on their discretion. And, uh, you know, that would be management's decision with the board um, to determine if that's a, a viable uh, organization to, to fully commit to in terms of acquiring the stock. So uh, those have been disclosed in the financial statements as it's uh, meaningful information as assessing the overall uh, position of the, the organization and some of the commitments that they have available to them. Uh, last couple of notes uh, on the final page. Uh, COVID-19, uh, obviously we know that, uh, that we're still in this pandemic and uh, it has 
uh, wreaked havoc across uh, across the world. And uh, so this note just highlights that uh, there's uncertainty uh, that continues to exist, uh, you know, as we're still in the pandemic. Um, and uh, obviously that, uh, that we've seen that it has affected results in 2020. Uh, and, you know, it, presumably it's going to continue to affect results into 2021. And uh, the, the amount of that is uh, certainly uncertain at, at this point in time. Uh, obviously, we're, you know, hope for the best as, uh, as we all are. Uh, and then finally, the subsequent event note, uh, you know, after year end, uh, the organization had, uh, you know, done another advance to, to thrive, which was part of uh, uh, the original agreement that, that they had the ability to advance the money. So they have done so. Um, and so that uh, is disclosed as well. So uh, with that, uh, maybe I think I th uh, throw it back to uh, maybe Phil or, or Matt uh, for any further discussion. Yeah, perhaps I'll just jump in real quick um, and just share. Uh, the one thing that we do uh, we do every year is something called a management and dis discussion anal analysis document. And I'll just hold it up. This is what it looks like. It's a it's a package of, of materials and it's available on our website. And the management discussion and analysis document is meant to be read in conjunction with these financial statements because they are fairly complex. And so every Every year, uh, our management team gets together and we write this management discussion and analysis to capture um, sort of in a practical terms, management's rationale uh, and interpretation of what the financial statements mean. And it's designed to really be you know, a record of, of the history of the company. And so if you go back to the inception of the development corporation, uh, in our website, you'll see an MDNA, management discussion and analysis document for every year of operation. So in the future, folks can go back and, and want to know what the interpretation of a, of a specific transaction is, and it will be included in, in this document, which is about 25 page document. And as I said, it's there uh, for the benefit of the reader to have a better appreciation and understanding for what the numbers say, because it's no offense to these accountants, but it can be a little, a little cumbersome and dry to try and interpret what these statements mean. So that's what it's there for. And it, I believe it's already posted on our website for people to download and then read. The only thing is I just want to extend our thanks to KPMG, David, and the team uh, for their work on the audit. I'd like to thank the, the finance team, specifically and the management team in general, for kind of navigating through the lockdown, the stay-at-home orders to make sure that the auditors had all the information that they needed. Uh, thanks to the board of directors for their review. And then finally, I'd like to thank Matt and the team for their tireless work in 2020, in a very challenging year, as we all know. Uh, to make sure that we were still in a, a decent uh, financial position. So that's all I had to say, Matt. Great, thanks, Phil. And, and we really appreciate the work of the board as well as the rest of the uh, governance group of Development Corporation. Uh, we couldn't do it without the support that we have uh, from you guys, and I really appreciate that. <clears throat> I will just uh, move on to the slide that we're on right now, which is the appointment of auditor. Uh, as, a, as a matter of best business practice, you know, once every minimum of five years, companies uh, should go out and conduct an RFP to uh, assess the value for money uh, from your audit partner. Uh, and in this, this past year, we did that. We went from, I think we launched the, the RFP in June and concluded in August. We had uh, at least three submissions from professional auditing firms. And uh, KPMG was, uh, was selected by the audit committee of the board to represent us for the next few years. So uh, being that it's the AGM, uh, we're announcing that the KPMG will be the auditor for the next year. And has actually been appointed for uh, up to another, uh, I believe it's three more years. So congratulations to KPMG and uh, they know our company well, and we appreciate the efforts that they've gone through to be competitive in the marketplace and understand our business. And that's important. So thank you for that, David and KPMG. <clears throat> So with that, I'll just, I'll just move right along, uh, Audrey, into a review of 2021. <clears throat> you know, as, as Elena touched on, as Phil touched on, and David touched on, uh, you know, 2020 was a tough year, um, the year of the pandemic. And, and, you know, it's been a very challenging year for the management team and, um, and the staff. And, you know, frankly, the results that we've been able to produce um, and have the surpluses that we have generated uh, have have come through um, decisive action. We moved quickly and we access 
government programs to help offset some of our operating expenses, but it also had a devastating effect on our operations and our community generally. Uh, you know, our, our labor force uh, went through uh, a 50% reduction in headcount. And, and, you know, with that, with the closure of bingo, uh, you know, the sponsor program didn't get uh, the funding that they typically would every year. The, the toy bingo program that we would typically run every year uh, didn't get the benefit of those proceeds. So it was a very, very tough year. On uh, March 16th, we, we shut our operations, uh, including bingo. And we did open for a period of time in, in, uh, in July of last year until about December uh, with a 50 people max headcount. And, uh, you know, that was, that was okay. I mean, it helped offset some of our fixed expenses. Uh, you know, the disappointing thing, I guess, is before the pandemic hit, we were on, on track to have a record year, yeah. and, you know, at, at Six Nations Bingo. And bingo itself has been, uh, you know, has gone through a lot of evolution. And it was so proud of the team there and, and all that they've done to take that business to where it is today. Certainly the number one producing bingo operation, I believe, in Canada. And, and we've gotten there through a dedicated team. And so it was, it was difficult for us to have to pause and put the brakes on that, that incredible track record of success. You know, as I, as I said, uh, our, our headcount went from a peak in March uh, to 126 people on our payroll down to 61. And that's painful and that's people's lives. And, and you know, it's tough to make those tough decisions to have to curtail your, your employee base, you know, and we're hoping that, you know, they're there and in the market when we come back and we reopen and we're looking to look to rehire those people back uh, when we're allowed to do so. One, another uh, evolution that happened in 2020 was uh, the Development Corporation sort of sponsored the Internet Tower um, construction and we arranged a million dollars in financing from Two Rivers to help fund the capital investment in the Internet Towers. And I can say that as of today, the construction has started and we expect those towers to be up by the end of June and providing an enhanced service to 95% of our community members, which is a good thing. Uh, the United Energy Storage Project, which is a large battery storage uh, facility that we're proposing, uh, has gone through and uh, um, completed the community outreach at the end of 2020. And we're off to a good start in 2021 with that project. DEI uh, is an acronym for uh, uh, direct economic impact, which is a key measure for our management team and our board. And really what that is, is a way for us to look at a number, a metric that um, you know, enables us to assess our overall performance as a company. So direct economic impact, uh, you know, is distilled from surplus profits, it's distilled from the amount of payroll we put in the community, it's, it's distilled from transfer payments to the sponsor, to the bingo sponsors, as well as the council. And our targeted goal for 2020 was 39 million. And the reality was after COVID hit, the number came in at 25 million. So you can see devastating impact in terms of our overarching goal of direct economic impact. But nonetheless, we're focused on the long-term goal, our Economy 150 objective as a company. And we believe that uh, once we get through this pandemic, we will, in fact, get back on track to achieve that goal. And lastly, for 2020, you know, the Development Corporation was once again recognized as one of Canada's best managed companies. Uh, we're very proud of that. This is our third year in a row. And I, and I have to say, there's no way uh, that uh, we could have accomplished this goal if it wasn't for the dedicated support of our, of all of our staff, our management team, all the way down to our frontline employees, who've stuck through this, through layoffs and restarts and layoffs, and, and you know it's been a tough year. And extremely proud and thankful to have the team that we've got, and I appreciate all the support that they've given me and the management team, um, and I look forward to many many prosperous years in the future. So with that, I'll skip into a forward sort of looking uh, perspective, uh, what we, what we think is going to happen in 2021. And we're already, geez, almost halfway through the year already. It's scary how fast time flies. Um, but, you know, as, as, as uh, D David talked about in our statements, we have set aside uh, three point, I think it's $3.1 million in something we call the post pandemic relief reserve. And that $3 million is set aside to get us through and weather the storm for the balance of 2020. You know, right now we continually burn cash on a monthly basis because we don't have revenue sources to offset our fixed obligation. We can't continue on that path. And so we had to set aside funds from 2020 to get us through 2021. We're hopeful, fingers crossed, uh, with, you know, vaccines uh, rolling out and case counts going down that we'll be able to shortly reopen 
Bingo and our other on reserve operations. But until that time, COVID continues to have just a devastating effect on our, on our operation. You know, one of the things that we have done from an innovative standpoint is Bingo, the Bingo team and management have put together an online Bingo solution, which we're hoping to launch. And in fact, we have a test that's running on this Friday and we're hopeful that that'll be successful and we'll roll out online bingo to our customer base and that that could become a campaign or a, a gaming option that will continue well into the future, even post COVID. 24 ball bingo is, uh, is another game that we offer and we're hoping to potentially reopen that as early as July, given the, you know, based on what the community COVID situation might be. Unfortunately, we don't expect traditional bingo to reopen until probably, you know, very late 2021, if not early 2022. Uh, and then, you know, the select operation or resu resumption of business for the Chiefswood cabins, the gathering place, and other activities in tourism. Uh, we're hopeful that in Q3, Q4, uh, we can start to make inroads and, 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 you know, go through a calculated reopening based on what the COVID framework might look like at that time. Another op uh, opportunity emerging in 2021 is something we call the Sovereign Investment Fund. And we're actioning that right now. And ability, uh, essentially what that is, it's a an opportunity for community members to invest alongside the development corporation to generate tax exempt returns on their investments. And we're targeting you know, a rollout within probably Q3, Q4 of, of 2021. And uh, we will be out in front of the community and offering community members the opportunity to invest. And we'll have a number of investment symposiums so people can understand the risks and what it means to be a, a co-investor with a development corporation. But nonetheless, we've been successful in generating you know, uh, healthy returns from our economic investments in wind farms and solar farms. And this sovereign investment fund is a way in which we can activate community equity and capital to participate with us in some of these great projects. Uh, so uh, the next one is the internet towers. I already mentioned we're, we're on track to have those deployed and operational uh, by probably um, you know, end of June, uh, mid July at, at the latest. And we will achieve that 95% community coverage, which we'll be very proud of. And we know it's really needed right now. And then, as I mentioned already, the United Energy Storage Project is something that you know, we're getting momentum on. And in fact, today I was involved in a presentation with the Minister of Infrastructure from Canada, as well as uh, the CEO from the Canada Infrastructure Bank of around the Canada Infrastructure Bank's commitment to invest up to $170 million of debt financing into the United Energy Storage Project, which will be a game changer in the energy market in Ontario. And in fact, for us, it's a, it's a, it's a good development because as a, a renewable energy developer and investor, we see firsthand how much energy gets curtailed or in other words, generated and not used because we don't have a capability to harness this power. The, the United Energy Storage Facility will become the catalyst to harness energy, store it and put it back into the grid when we need it, as opposed to it being sold off to the United States at a, at a loss or just you know, purely wasted. And as I briefly mentioned, Autonomy 150 really is the focal point for us as a group. Uh, autonomy 150 is the target to generate $150 million of direct economic impact every year. And we have targeted the year 2025 to meet that goal. Of course, COVID has had a devastating setback. So we're, we're gonna you know, revisit and reevaluate whether or not 2025 is realistic, but I can tell you we're not deviating from the Autonomy 150 goal. That goal is, is in my mind set in stone. It's just a matter of timing and how we can best achieve that without over, without over uh, leveraging ourselves or taking on the undue risks. So I think the, from a forward looking perspective, once we, we emerge from this pandemic, we've gone through some tough times. We've pivoted a lot of our business. It's caused us to pause and look at how we do things, be more innovative, embrace opportunities. And you know, I think we are for the, ultimately a leaner and, and more focused company as a result of this pivot painful um but we're but you know we're very optimistic as we emerge from this pandemic to get right back to business and continue to produce the results of why we were created so with that i will pause there audrey and turn it back to you thank you thank you very much for the um the audit presentation as well as the capsule of how COVID impacted on us but just like the resilient and adaptive people we are and hardworking, you know, you showed where we're still moving. We're not, you know, nobody's, nobody's sitting this one out. We're still moving and thank you very much for that overview. So I'm gonna turn it over now to a question and answer period to Matt. 
Philip Johnson and David Marks regarding the presentation of the 2020 audit. Hi, so I was wondering, um, why did you enter into a loan agreement with Brant County and have they paid that back yet? Yeah, I'll, I could answer that. So the, we entered into a loan agreement with Brant County for $193,500. And uh, the reason we did that is because the, uh, the development in the Brant Business Park, uh, uh, the Adidas distribution facility, um, had development plans to include a rooftop solar project on the roof. And we had had and still have a relationship with Brant County to collaborate on renewable energy assets in the county. And the way that the program rules work for the IESO, which is the Independent Electricity System Operator, once a contract is, is generated, the, the holder of that contract can't sell or transfer any rights for a period of five years. And, and our original agreement with Brant County was that we would have an opportunity to participate in equity. In other words, in ownership of those assets. But because of the contractual limitations uh, with that contract, we had to create a, a mechanism which mimicked our equity ownership. And so we did that through a convertible loan. The $193,500 loan, as I said, it's convertible into equity after that five year period where the contract limitation expires. And in the short term, they pay us and they are paying us, I believe it's 9.13% interest on that note, uh, which would be the equivalent of a return we would have generated if we were otherwise an investor directly in the project. So effectively what we've done is we've found a workaround to the contract limitation. And it's not because Brand County needed the money, uh, it's, it's about uh, them fulfilling their obligation to us as a partner and making way for us to participate in an equity-like position and ultimately in an equity position after the five-year term. Right, thank you. Uh, so another question, um, who or what is Thrive and, and why make an investment in that? Uh, I'll, I'll tackle that one as well. Uh, maybe Phil, if you wanna jump in at the end, you're more than welcome to do that. But uh, sure. I will, I will. so Thrive is a, it's a licensed cannabis producer in Ontario. They're in close proximity to our community. And we are not an equity investor. We don't, we, we're not an owner of shares in Thrive. What we have is a debt placement that's secured by assets. And so, you know, we've, we've been monitoring the cannabis market very closely. Of course, we're waiting to see what happens here in the community before we make a decision around what our entry might be. But in the licensed cannabis space, we do see opportunity in the market. And, uh, you know, the opportunity to, to have a debt placement, and that's what it is, it's debt secured by assets uh, in Thrive was a strategic uh, in decision. And ultimately, we have the option uh, to convert that debt into an equity ownership position if we so choose. We have no obligation to do that. Uh, we have maximum latitude to just recover our money. Gener I think they're paying us 12.75% interest on our money, which is very attractive, especially in today's markets. And it's a fully secured debt placement. So for us, it was a it was a calculated investment, a, a calculated debt placement that could lead to an investment. And ultimately, who knows what the market will yield in the future? But it's secured by assets, so it's a very, very, um, very, very secure debt placement in our in our view. Well, where is it? Thrive Thrive Cannabis is located on Highway Three, just outside of Jarvis. Uh, also, what is 3DATX? 3DATX is a, is a company based in Buffalo, New York. And what they do is they are a vehicle emissions testing uh, technology company who have intellectual property rights to, uh, to enter into something called a PTI, the portable uh, testing, um, portable testing, uh, I can't remember the last, the last letter is the per no, periodic testing um, implementation equipment in the European Union. And so they have uh, intellectual property rights as well as uh, patent protected technology. And we have invested in equity and shares in 3 x And they are uh, the front runner in the placement of vehicle emissions control testing in the European Union. And, and that market opportunity is spreading now in this southern uh, South America, and ultimately will, it will reemerge in North America. If you think back to the Ontario drive clean days where you'd have to take your car and get, 
dry clean test every few years. Okay. This is a this is a similar technology, only it's a portable technology where you don't require, you know, a whole facility. There's actually like the size of a briefcase. You could take this technology anywhere and run vehicle diagnostics and, and emissions control testing. So from an environmental standpoint, it fits within our within um, you know our strategic assessment of opportunities. It's smart, it's innovative, and we believe it's going to be a game changer in the market space. How how long do you uh foresee A6N uh, having losses and then why is that? A6N uh, has had a couple of couple of rough years. Um, you know, in 2020, uh, really the losses, the losses that we incurred, actually the way I would characterize it is 2019 was a bad year for us um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one of which, uh, you know, we went through a protest, a very tough protest on the Niagara reinforcement line that delayed our capability of getting the project done, ran up our costs and ultimately triggered a loss uh, in the operation. Um, but we ultimately finished the contract and we got the job done. Uh, we also ran into some hurdles with uh, the installation of our community waste um, water main and you know, our contract margins weren't what they, we expected them to be. So we weren't able to dig ourselves out of the hole that was created in 2019. As, as for 2020, you know, any operation like A6N that's got, you know, the, the overhead that they have, the number of people they have in their workforce, uh, equipment and all those fixed obligations, you need to have, you know, a sufficient amount of revenue in order to offset those costs. And when COVID hit in March, all of our client base shut down operations and you know, they stopped contracting, they stopped their, their projects, frankly. And so we had to idle our workforce and idle a lot of our equipment. And that's really the driver of the loss in 2020. In 2021, so far, we are off on a, on a great year and we don't expect to have losses uh, like we had in 2019 or 2020 moving forward. And, you know, frankly, as I said earlier, you know, the, the, the COVID pandemic caused a pause and it did take a, it did trigger, you know, management and our partner at Acon to sit down and have a really hard look at what business A6N is in and how are we going to refine our focus to do things that we can execute well at the most attractive margin and yet create the number, the greatest number of employment opportunities for our community members. And so we have, we have reemerged in 2021, A6N has, as a, as a leaner, more focused company. And I think in 2021, we'll see the benefit of that. How many people were laid off? Uh, what's your workforce size then versus now? Right now, our, our workforce at A6N hovers around 40 to 45 people. At peak in uh, the summer of 2019, as an example, we had 155 people working for us. But you know, A6N is a company that, it, that works in the ebb and flow of the construction business. It is a unionized uh, environment. So we have the ability to call up our members when we need them for specific jobs, but when we don't need them, they're, they're not working. That's just the nature of the game. Of course, we are, we're out in the marketplace looking for stable contracts where we can continually employ our community members. But the nature of the construction space is it's very volatile. There's ebbs and flows in the market and we have to be nimble and we have to be able to move quickly in terms of managing and adjusting our labor force. And within the development corporation, I already said, you know, our workforce is down, you know, 61 people, I believe we have right now. And that's a 50% reduction of where we were in March, 2020. Um, so also wondering, in 2020, uh, your board of directors had a savings of almost $20,000, where your advisory committee's expenses went up almost 8000 Is there a reason for that? Um, I have to go look at the statements. Um, I, I assume page you're 20. looking on page on page 20. Yeah. So when you when you say savings, can you can you just describe what you mean by savings? Uh, well, it, um, in 2020, uh, the board of directors spent thirty thousand two hundred and fifty, but in 2019, they spent almost uh, fifty two thousand. At the same time, um, your advisory committee in 2020 spent 
6,600 and but in 2019 they only spent 29,000. The one thing that we need to consider is uh, 2019 numbers that are reflected on on this schedule are nine months of expenses versus the 2020 numbers of, tw of uh, 12 months. So that might that might account for some of the difference that you're talking about. Um, but I, I see as I scan, you know, the, the honor area is is increased in 20. It was it was fairly high in 2019 versus 2020 for the board as an example. And, and you know the board, we need to meet as frequently as we as we need to based on the dynamics of the business. So um, there is volatility in board order area as we as we navigate the activities of the company. Um, but, you know, if you, for anything more precise than that, I'd have to spend some time looking at the actual expenses to to give you a more of an in depth assessment of that. I don't know, David or Phil, if you had anything you want to add. The, the only thing. That, sorry. Just wondering like why one went up and one went down. Both governance bodies perform different functions, right? So the board of directors, uh, their function in the, in the overall company is to look at performance. So how are our investments performing? What are the investment decisions? The level of, the level of focus and complexity is different than what the advisory committee does. The advisory committee looks at things of conformance are the activities of the company conforming with the best interests of the community? The workload, there may be an imbalance in the workload. There may be other things happening, uh, whether it's policy reviews uh, and other activities that are taking place based on the mandate of that particular governance group that might, that might warrant additional expense. Would it possibly be that you didn't have a full board of directors that year? That could also be a driver. I'd have to really dig into the numbers, but yeah, that could be part of it. I'm just wondering, as I go through this uh, um, later tonight, who's gonna be available for questions tomorrow? I believe we have Alicia on the call. Uh, Alicia. <laughs> Alicia will be available to take any questions. You can send an email to the list uh, provided on the, on the slideshow. And uh, Alicia will receive your questions and turn around a response in short order. Um, will everything be posted? Because we haven't had access to the trust funds uh, audits. Or I didn't catch that last that last statement. Uh, will everything be posted? Because we haven't had access to the the trust funds audits. Yeah, my understanding is it'll be posted on our website or on the trust website. Sorry, just to jump in, if it's the Economic Development Trust financial statements, it has been posted on both the SNGRDC website as well as the EDT website. Um, Victoria, I can email it to you if you haven't found it, though. It would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Are there any other questions? Anything out there for, for Matt or Philip or David? I'll just say a reminder, the MDNA that I talked about is also going to be made available on the website and I think it's there now. So please take your time, go through it. And if there are questions, the email uh, contact info is there. We'd be happy to answer the questions. And uh, I appreciate the support from everybody on the call. And thanks again to the governance group, Audrey, for the MC role. And uh, we appreciate your help and a shout out to my staff for all the hard work that they put through, that oh, they put in every year. Yeah. yeah. All right, with this, and then thank you, Matt, for that. We'll close everything, and um, we'll just say thank you again to everyone. Matt said it all. He's, you know, thanked every one of us, and I really want to say thank you to all the people that attended and expressed interest in what we're doing. Um, I think it's very important for people to have questions and look through the material and know what's going on in your community with your community money and also with the community itself being developed. 
Okay, so thank you everyone tonight.